Okay, so today's not George Fisher. Mike's not working. It's just for recording. Mike's not working. Just for recording. 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 Just you got to just speak out. Okay. <laughs> All right. So today's my so mic. You want to say something, George? No, no. Give me the mic if you, you're not speaking up. No, I'm not speaking up. All right. So today's my session to introduce Emiliano Valdez uh, from Enred. Uh, Emiliano is originally from Italy. He got all his degrees uh, there at the University of uh, Padova. Did I get it correct? Uh, is it spelling? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and then he spent. Uh, some time at the University of Minnesota as a postdoc. He has done very interesting work, uh, and I've been following uh, quite a few of the things he's been doing. And uh, today he's going to be talking about the latest and greatest things that uh, he's working on. Thanks, Emiliano, for being with us today. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for telling you. Yeah, it's great to be here with this well known department. And also it's great to see some good old friends here. So today we'll be <clears throat> talking about one recent work that I have with my collaborators, Sharon Stopley, who is an actor in University of Minnesota, and Brian Johnson, a well-known face in this department. And let me out. Yes? And Sarah's too. Yeah, of course, of course, but now it changed uh, very much. Let me outline the problem and statement right away, just to consolidate the objectives. We are looking at distribution systems uh, featuring a number of distributed energy resources, for instance, uh, TV systems or energy storage systems. Can you and put up the mic closer? No, it's not working. It's just for the video. It's for the recording, George. It's not for the only recording. Uh -huh. I will speak louder. <laughs> so the objective here is to optimize the, the operation of this distribution system in a well-defined sense. Right? So people have looked at optimization approaches where you formulate network-wide optimization problems that are solved either centrally or in a decentralized setup according to well-defined computational complexity limits. Once the problem is solved, the set points for these devices are being passed down, and the local controllers will drive the, 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 out, the power output toward these set points. Right? So there is an inherent temporal boundary here between the optimization task and the local control task. Here we would like to clear also by, first of all, strategically distributing the computational burden across areas. And when we develop these local controllers, we want to, <coughs> this local optimization task, we want to encapsulate the dynamics of the local controllers. And this one will become clear later on, but I just, I just wanted to settle down the problem. So here, as a motivation, we are looking at, today we are looking at the distribution system with high penetration of PV systems. And here you know that for PV systems operating according to current practices, when generation exceeds the demand, there are reverse power flows. And this will make yield to over voltage conditions in the field. So we envision these tools to bypass these over voltage conditions and therefore ensure seamless integration of PV system in this case, but in general resources of energy without compromising both system reliability and efficiency. Another issue that we're looking at is how to cope with variability of other conditions, in this case, solar radiation conditions. What if uh, solar radiation conditions are changing uh, while I'm still solving an automation problem? It means that I'm dispatching outdated set points. Set points that may even need to over voltages or under voltage conditions, right? So here we have faster dynamics at the distribution scale as opposed to possibly slower automation tasks. And here, what we would like to do is to ensure adaptability of our control optimization schemes to fast change in other conditions. So now that I set a little bit the, the motivations, let me introduce some very quickly some notation. We are considering a distribution system with a given set of uh, nodes here, blue, where we have where we have PV systems, and another set of nodes, calligraphic and sabo, where we have either only loads or just uh, zero injection points. 
and we can consider a general multi-phase of balance or unbalanced system. So go to the info in case of simplicity, we assume that the system is balanced. Okay? But everything carries over naturally to multi-phase systems. Okay, so you very well know the general balance equation, where here calligraphic VI and calligraphic I sub I denote the phase of representation of voltage and inject the current and denote I. And here, this term here is equal to the difference between real and reactive power available at the AC endpoint of our inverter minus the real reactive load, denoted as PL and QL I. Okay? Now, the building block for the framework are inverters with computational and communication capabilities. We have inverters with microcontrollers that implement both local controllers for fast controlling of the output powers and a more sophisticated layer with communication and computation capabilities. Now, we are going to model the dynamics of the output power, real reactive output powers of the inverters as a possibly nonlinear dynamical system where X of phi here collects the real and reactive power averaged over one AC cycle, whereas this one, this vector here U, collects the real and reactive set points of the inverters. These set points are sent down to the local controllers by this green layer. Okay? And then we have D that may capture possible dis exogenous disturbances. Now we have the following assumption. For constant commanded inputs that belong to a given set that specify the inverter operating regions, and we show some examples in the next slides, we are assuming that this primary controller here is designed so that there exists an equilibrium point for the output powers where the output powers are equal to the commanded inputs. So we have tracking capabilities of, our, of the commanded inputs. Okay? And you can see some models uh, in this book here where inverters are designed to behave either as a first order system or a second order system depending on the specific application. Now, as far as this set here is concerned, but, 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 uh, yes. your, your inputs and your state variables are the same? Yes. I command given some, some set points, and then this local controller is designed so that the output powers will be driven to this command set points. And actually, inverters right now are designed. Uh, so VI, QI, and UI, those, those, those are fixed. This guy here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, this and so you, you want to maintain a constant power and constant uh, uh, real and reactive power. Yeah. And what's the DI? Possible exogenous disturbances uh, okay. or, or a model dynamics. Yeah. Good, great. So now I talk about this, uh, <coughs> this uh, set regarding why people look at different strategies, namely active power curtailment, if this one represents the NPTT point or power, real power available, inverters are allowed to operate on this uh, horizontal line. People like Professor Umeo Garcia look at reactive power compensation strategies, uh, where here, given some the inverter rating, uh, the inverters are allowed to operate on this vertical line. And people like myself that look at the more general setup, uh, where inverters can operate anywhere in this region color-coded in orange, subject to possible, some possible minimum power factor constraints. Okay? Mathematically, you can characterize this uh, region here in this way, where here we take into account for the inverter rating. Here are some possible power factor constraints. And this one is just you know, in order to, the, you can pick this P-mean either to equal to P-A-V if you want to consider reactive power compensation or to zero if you want to consider these two cases here. But any, either way, this one, from an optimization standpoint, is a set that is convex, closed, and bounded. And this one will be critical for the formulation of the optimization problems later on. Okay? <coughs> 
we will look at the following strategy. Based on, uh, based on some load and weather data, we are going to formulate these uh, automation problems, for instance, optimal power flow renditions, in order to compute this optimal set points, okay, according to some well-defined objectives. Okay? Now, bear in mind that here we need to wait, we need to solve this optimization problem, and then we just pass down the optimal set points. And then based on our assumption in the previous slide, these inverters here will drive the output powers to these set points. Clear so far? So there is an inherent temporal separation between this optimization task and this local controller. OK, people have looked at way to solve relevant optimization problems, and I will elaborate further on these problems with in the next slides, either using off-the-shelf solvers or relevant complex relaxations. Or people have also looked at ways to solve these problems here in a decentralized setup, where typically the computation of the problems is broken down in different pieces, and each piece is solved is computed at different ways. OK? They said, Either way, there is an inherent time scale separation. Slower time scales, I need to wait to solve automation problem, and faster time scales, the local controllers that will be driving the output powers towards the set points that I computed. Okay? We are looking at a different setup. We are still looking at ways to solve the problem in a distributed setup. And I will show you in the next slide how to derive the math here. But the novelty here is that we add a feedback direction here where we measure relevant electrical quantities at the point of interconnection in the system, be it powers, be it voltages. And then these measurements are accommodated inside the local optimization task. Okay? And here, you may notice that I don't wait for these iterations to converge to the solution optimization problem. Rather, I send down to the inverters new set points as they become available. The goal, therefore, is how to is to come up with the math here so that eventually the, these set points here and output powers are driven toward the solution of the network wide automation problem that I formulated. And the benefits that we are envisioning are, as I said before, adaptability to fast changing conditions and operational, operational efficiency because we are continuously changing, changing OPR solutions. Okay? But the key question here is the following. Here we have a closed loop system with some, with some discrete time updates and some continuous time creatures. Is this closed loop, closed loop system here stable? How do we account for communication constraints as well as complexity constraints in these green blocks and also hardware limitations? Because eventually these operations here need to be implemented in the microcontrollers and inverters, right? So we will try to answer at least to a couple of these questions in the next slides, okay? So you all know what is an optimal power flow problem, so it will be very quick. So here, a prototypical optimal power flow problem, here we want to minimize a given cost function that can capture both network-oriented objectives, like minimization power losses, and inverter-related objectives, like minimization of the real power that we contain. Okay, subject to our balance constraints for nodes with and without inverters, right? and bounds on the voltage magnitude in order to enforce voltage regulation. And of course, this, uh, we enforce our set points to belong to the inverter operating region. Now, you already know, and I need to tell you, that this problem here, unfortunately, is a non convex and MP hard quadratic <coughs> constraint quadratic program. And people have looked at different kind of heuristics or of the shell solvers for non-convex problems. We are not going to use today these heuristics and these uh, of the shell solvers, first of all, because they do not ensure optimality. But this is not a problem. 
for us. Right? I'm not here to claim whether these solids are good or not. We are not. What I'm concerned about is that they impede a distributed solution. And the objective of today is to develop distributed controllers. Convex relaxation techniques, namely second order con relaxations, semi deficit program relaxations, including Professor Garcia and Professor Zhu, or convex linearizations of approximation time, of approximation of the optimal task. The framework I'm going to show you works for any convex relaxation and any linearization of the OPM. Today, for illustration purposes, I will utilize the semi definite program relaxation because I know that you are familiar with this, so I can just go through this very quickly. So, you know so that you purposefully use the real reactive uh, coordinates to have the quadratic constraints, right? Say it again, please. You purposefully use not the voltage magnitude and, and angle, but to use the real and reactive uh, coordinates so that your uh, constraints are going to be quadratic. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, okay. So, okay. So you very well know that if allow me to stack in a vector i, all the currents that are injected. <laughs> In a, in a vector i, and I do the same for the voltages, I can relate uh, currents and voltages uh, in this way here, where y is a matrix that we build based on the phi equivalent model of the lines uh, and the system topology, right? Then based on this relation, I will express powers and voltage magnitudes uh, as linear functions of this outer product matrix B here, right? And then if you allow me to introduce some pertinent emission matrices here, I can express the net real reactive power injected at each node as linear function of this matrix variable B, right? And I can do the same for the voltage magnitudes. Now, I can reformulate the OPF in the following equivalent way, where essentially here, I'm just defining this uh, convex and compact set uh, calligraphy B here, which is the set of positive semi definite matrices, so that voltage constraint is satisfied, okay? And all the balance constraint is satisfied for the nodes without inverters. Then I'm leaving out uh, the constraints for the inverters on purpose, uh, you will understand why. Where here, this vector h here is just, com is just collecting these two quantities here. U collects the real and active set points, and D collects the real and active loads. Okay? Then the only source of non convexity here is this non constraint, but as you already know, I can just, in the spirit of the STP relaxation, I can just drop it. It doesn't end up with a convex relaxation of the OPF problem. Okay? And, if, and this problem here is an STP. Now, you may ask yourself, do we have a rank one? Well, as Professor Dominguez has showed, for systems that are balanced and radial, there are sufficient conditions under which this adaptation is of tight. It's still an open question for multi phased and possibly unbalanced systems. Okay? And people are currently looking at that. However, let me just tell you that whatever I present next can be applied to any common relaxation and any linearization of the OPF. It, it is not dependent on this particular SDP relaxation. So I'm going to make three assumptions regarding our underlying OPF. The first assumption is that we have a strictly convex cost. The second assumption is that we have a physical problem. And, uh, a finite optimal cost. And the third one is a fairly technical assumption that says if you take the gradient of this constraint here, then the resultant vectors are all linear independent. This one is in the spirit of the so called linear independence constraint qualification, and then ensures that the dual variables exist, belongs to a bounded set, and in specific case they are unique. And the transmission level is tantamount to saying that the the location of marginal prices are different. Okay? Now, 
Okay. Is dual gradient type approaches to solve convex optimization problems. So if we consider the Lagrangian of our relaxed OPF, where here lambda here is the vector collecting the Lagrangian multipliers associated with the balance constraint, I can perform the following primal dual updates at discrete time instants. I have the classical dual ascent step, right? Where here alpha is the step size. And then based on the up-to-date Lagrangian multipliers, I'm updating u and v, the primal variables, by simply minimizing the Lagrangian with respect to these two quantities, okay? In this specific example, the minimization of Lagrangian can be decoupled across primal variables, right? Now, first of all, bear in mind, look at this, and you will realize the difference with the next slide. Here, we actually have the primal variables in the dual, in the dual uh, ascent step. Right? Now, there are different convergence claims uh, for these primal dual updates uh, depending on the step size that you pick. If you pick a sequence of step sizes that is non summable but square summable, then you can have asymptotic convergence of both the dual variables to the optimal ones, of course, and the primal variables. Okay? If your step size is constant, you can have other <coughs> kind of different uh, claims. Uh, and I encourage you to follow the class of Hungarian Edis uh, to learn more about this. Uh. But now, bear in mind these three steps. We are going to use these three steps to build uh, the local controllers. Specifically, consider this case. Uh, in the green box, uh, where you remember I present the layer of the microcontroller with computational and communication probabilities, we have these three steps here. But now we pick the updated primal variable that represents the inverse points. And we use this update to construct a stepwise constant reference signal for our inverter by using a sample and fold unit. OK? Now, we feed this signal here to the inverter. And then we sample the inverter output. Again, I remind you, I recall that X collects the real and relative powers, average over the C cycle. We sample the output. And then we utilize this sampled output to update these controlling signals. Specifically, I'm utilizing the sampled output here in the dual ascent step instead of the primal variable, OK? Yes? How fast is the dynamics in the blue bo uh, box compared to the time you are spending to do each update? Excellent question. So Professor Domingo Garcia is saying, how do you compare the dynamics here with the dynamics of this block, right? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the specific uh, convex relaxation or linearization of the problem that you are using. I can tell you that this, the update of the unit here, can be done in a subset. In fact, for some specific uh, inverted operating regions, like the active power compensation or active power compensation, this, this one boils down to a close form solution, right? For subset, it's just multiplications and additions. This one is the this one is the bottom end, right? This one is the bottom end. Because in this particular presentation, this one is still an SDP. Take second, right? right? And this one will motivate something that I will show you a few slides down the road, where we consider the case where we have a simple update. So, so are you, for example, saying that um, you know the updates on the green box take on the order of a couple of seconds? Even a second. Uh -huh. And uh, how does that uh, compare with the time constants in the blue box? Because that's that, I mean, the, yeah. the dynamics is all coming from the switching in the inverter, yeah. right? Yeah. So if that's much faster, I I mean, I see where you are coming with this that, uh, you know, you can assume that uh, you apply the control and then, you know, it's going to have enough time for the dynamics in the blue box to yeah. come. So, okay, that's, that's, that's what you're asking. Yeah, this is what I'm going to tell you now. Oh, okay. Because if you have an inherent time scale separation, 
where these guys, you can compute these guys here sufficiently slow so that every time that you sample, uh, the output power coincide with the command and input, uh, then here you can replace uh, X with U, right? Exactly. So this one is still a dual ascent step and all the convergence claim that you have in the previous slide, not to recall the order to be set up. Done. There is no novelty. However, if you are able to speed up the computation of these steps here, or on the other side of the coin, uh, the dynamics here are sufficiently slow, then if you sample fast enough, uh, you may have the case where X and U don't coincide. And so this one is no longer a dual ascent step. It's something like, I don't know, an inexact uh, update, right? Uh, and I guess you can maybe, you know, if, if you have some bound on what the difference would be, then you could add it to the dynamics and, you know, do some convergence analysis with that bound, right? Yeah, I think that I think that somebody gave you my slide before because uh, <laughs> you are always predicting the next slide. Yeah, right? that's, uh, I guess, yeah. I'm just kidding, just kidding. Yes. The first one is, uh, how do you get DI on top of the equation? Like, that's the disturbance, right? On the I. Yeah, that one is just, that one is the low essentially. Yeah. You're already kind of measuring that, essentially, right? Yeah. And then, so the second question is, what is, D is not a local variable that depends on all the voltages that's supposed to be distributed. Yeah. Region, right? So how do they get. Yeah, the yeah. I will, yeah, I will show you later on how to break it down. Also, I think that I don't know someone else has done something distributed, distributed as the peers of Mr. Alejandro. Okay, but I, I will elaborate on this uh, later in the slide, in the, in the presentation. But good point. And if I don't elaborate on that, please do Okay. Okay. Now there are a few technicalities. I will go through these technicalities very, very fast. So the first thing to observe is that, is that. The gradient of the, dual of the dual function in this case here is bounded. And why is it bounded? Because these primal sets here, calligraphy V and all the inverted operating regions, are compact sets. Okay? This is something that you will learn in the class of uh, Galileo. Sir. The second fact is the following. If I look at the way I'm updating uh, the primal variables U, this one can be seen as a function of lambda. And this function here is Lipsky's continuous. We say with a Lipschitz constant L. So this motivates uh, bounding uh, in some sense, uh, as Professor Dominguez was saying, the error that I'm committing on the dual domain. Okay? So meaning that if X uh, is different than U, then there exists, uh, due to the continuity of this function here, there exists a lambda tilde so that X would have been the primal update that I would have obtained. Okay? So here we're just enforcing some bounds on the discrepancies on the actual lambda and the one that would have given me x instead of u. And this one translates in a bound between the discrep for the discrepancy of the actual output x and the command that input u. Okay? So you assume something on the dual domain, then you use the various projection, projection theorems in order to translate these bounds on the primal variables. Based on these assumptions, we can claim the following theorem. So under this Mayan modeling assumption, if you utilize a step size sequence, alpha k, that is non-summable but square summable, then this closed loop system here is stable. And not only stable, but you have asymptotic convergence of the dual variables, lambda to the optimal dual arguments. Mm -hmm. You have asymptotic convergence of the reference inputs, as well as of this matrix V, that in, at this stage here is an auxiliary variable. And we also have asymptotic convergence of the output powers to this optimal set point. And these three conditions here hold for, for conditions. These three statements here hold for any initial condition <coughs> of both dual and primal variables, and for any interval duration between two consecutive sampling times. So it doesn't really matter how frequently I sample my output. This is uh, a closed loop system. OK? So just to give you an illustration, Consider a toy example. It's a very small system with just five inverters. 
Okay, just believe me here, this should be inverted one, two, three, or five. And let us assume that we are modeling the, the inverted dynamics as a first order system with a given time constant out. Here I'm plotting the output power pi over time. <coughs> Did you use the PDF no, by chance? Uh, no, this is okay. powerful. Just believe me, here there should be some numbers, but that's fine. <laughs> So here you see that there is convergence of these output powers towards a specific point, and in this specific case, this matter, you can say it is the solution of an OPF. But in this case, you see that every time that I update the reference signals, I'm letting my, inver my inverter output to set to this, uh, to this uh, reference input. Because 9 tau is, is enough time for the first of the system to set to the to the commanded inputs, right? In this case, instead here, I'm updating my reference input every 0.9 tau, well below the inverter set in time, which is approximately 5 tau for the first order system, right? Still, the output powers are converging to, this, to the OPS solution. And they're actually converging significantly faster due to this time scale compression, okay? If you're interested, I can tell you, I can give you a sketch of the proof. But the key is to notice that whenever x, the sampled power output, is different than u, the commanded subpoints, then this x represents a suboptimal primal update, and this one leads to an epsilon subgradient. As, as opposed to the dual gradient. What is an epsilon subgradient? Okay, look at this. Suppose that here we are trying to minimize this function, this primal function here, j of u. So the update, the optimal value will be this one, right? So this one is the is the primal update that you that you obtain by using these primal dual steps. This one translates in a dual domain to a gradient of the dual function evaluated at the current Lagrange multipliers lambda, right? As you see, and the, the form of the gradient is this, all right? Now, let's, 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 let us suppose that we are moving away from this optimal point here. We are moving to this point here, which is the cost function evaluated at x, the sample output. And this one is at most epsilon suboptimal, right? Then this epsilon suboptimality translates here to an epsilon subgradient. Essentially, you pick your lambda here, you move epsilon away, and then you consider the epsilon subdifferential, which is the set, in this case the set of lines that pass through this point here and are either tangential to the dual function or stay above the dual function. And this is a, a SAC analytical definition. Okay? Now, based on this observation, Emiliano, I have yes. a question on the previous one where you went to nine times the time constant. Usually, five times the time constant, it dies out. Okay. That, that's 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 the usual scale that we use. So why do you have to go all the way to nine? Well, oh, nine. well, I can do it in five. You want, but they're exactly the same, right? Yeah, I mean, in other words, I don't, I, I don't understand the nine unless you're looking for uh, uh, numbers which are perfect squares. No, I just want to. I just want to go beyond five. Because that's the rule of thumb we use. Five. Yeah. But if you, yeah, if you did five, the result is change much. good point. I will add the. I will consider five now in a bit. Oh, I, I, I have a lot of fives to sell. That's why I'm. Okay. Okay. So, so Emiliano, I have a question. For, would it buy you? Would it buy you anything to do the following scheme? I mean, in here, uh, you are updating the command at every iteration yeah. of the of the algorithm of the optimization algorithm. Would, for example, buy you something to, or you know, update every number instead of doing it every time, do it every five times, and uh, in the interim, actually just run in open loop in the sense of using a standard uh, mm -hmm. uh, dual uh, ascent uh, approach yeah. without without uh, feeling back <coughs> the exit. Would that buy you anything? That is an excellent question. Yeah? And I think that 
So, for methodology that has backfield, you can use the very same uh, <coughs> arguments based on actions of data to prove convergence of this thing that you're saying. In terms of implementation, the question is I don't know. I, and I would love to, to try to map up the first to see what's happening. Here. Sure, and the uh, convergence speed, would you gain anything, for example, or this is the best you can do? Because there might be some trade off on how often. Yeah, yeah, as you can say. How often you, you want to sample the inverted output, right. Right? and how how many times you want to open the primal, you want to compute the primal dual steps in open Exactly. That is an excellent question. I'm not sure whether you're going to have gains or losses in terms of speed of convergence, because it is always a first order system. Sure. Uh, sorry, first order method. Yes. But it's an excellent question. We can try Sure. Great. So, if you yes. elaborate on that a little bit, so far I haven't seen you bring in anything about the structure of the problem, the characteristics of the network. Okay. Where do you take that into account in terms of uh, tuning this, this scheme? Can you elaborate on the more characteristics? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that you have, say, a radial network rather than a mesh network in a distribution system, okay. where is that taken into account in terms of how you uh, tune the algorithms that you use over here. So, Because this could be any other problem. It doesn't have to be the powerful problem in terms of what you're, uh, what you're giving me. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see where do you bring in the specifics, the salient characteristics of the, uh, of the, of the power system network, the distribution yeah. network. Yeah, in two, in two, in two places. Because the okay. one is the formulation of the PI problem. And secondly, when it comes to modeling the dynamics of inverters, other than that, in any other place. In, uh, is there anywhere where you take into account uh, the fact that you have a radial structure that, that gives you uh, some insights of the behavior? No. no. Because it should. It should be different than in a transmission network. What should be different? The whole structure of the problem, because we have much less interdependence among the nodes of a certain nature. We don't have the Kirchhoff's voltage laws. I see. So, we can avoid that. It's a good point. So far, I'm just taking into account this uh, during the video connect conversation. We can so far avoid this point. That's a good point. Thanks for putting it down. So, we will put the bill together yes. of all the points we're bringing up, okay? And, uh, huh? Alejandro and I will uh, put a set of points together and then we'll yeah. send our uh, uh, charges. I'm not charging for those. Why not free, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me just tell you that here, what we are doing in this lemma here was to characterize uh, the amount of. Uh, I mean, to characterize the error epsilon that we have at every at every time dk here, OK? And once you, once you find uh, this analytical bound for this error here in order to prove convergence of this closed loop system, you can leverage some existing uh, convergence uh, claims uh, in this paper here, where these folks have looked at uh, <coughs> convergence of, uh, of subgradient type uh, uh, approaches uh, with uh, dual, inexact dual steps under various uh, step size rules. Okay? Now, to answer to the question of I handled before, we need to take into account also computational limits. Why? Because I said that the lambda update and the U update can be performed really fast. Really fast. This is just addition and multiplication. So this one sometimes can afford even a closed form solution. Okay? What about this? Again, in this specific presentation, this one is an SDP, it takes seconds. Although if we if instead of considering an SDP relaxation of the OPF problem, we consider a linearized approximation, even this guy here can afford a cross-form solution. But still, if you want to take into account this discrepancy, we can consider an asynchronous scheme like this, where I assume that these two steps here can perform at this time step dk, whereas this uh, computationally more heavy step uh, can be performed only m time slots. So 
I'm starting the computation of this step here now. I'm getting the results five steps down the road. In this, in this example here, m equals to two, right? I'm updating my vectors u every time slot. I'm updating my matrix b every two time slots. Okay? So is this uh, a stable closed loop system? We don't know. Still we need to prove, right? But we have the following theorem. Again, under our current modeling assumptions and assuming that the V update can be performed every M with M finite, of course, step uh, uh, time intervals. If we use, again, a step size sequence that is non summable but square summable, we have asymptotic convergence of both dual variables and primal variables to the dual and primal optimal solutions. Okay? And again, these three claims here hold for any initial conditions and also for any duration of this interval here. Okay? So similar claims to the previous theorem, but in this case we are considering asynchronous updates or the control signals. Now, also to answer to your question before, no, your question before, here we have this decentralized implementation like this, right? So we have the lambda update and the u update, so here this is a typo, that is implemented at each inverter, right? And these inverters are exchanging relevant information, in this case, Lagrange multipliers and HI of V, which is essentially two scalars, right? A two by one vector, with the utility. And utility is performing this, uh, this uh, update, right? So the utility is pursuing network-wide optimization objectives, whereas the inverter is pursuing local optimization objectives. But you can do a step even further because you know that Alejandro, and also myself, and also Professor Zhu have looked at ways to solve semi definite programs in a decentralized setup. So you can also envision a setup where the filler <laughs> is broken down in different areas, and you can break down also the computation of this matrix here across the image. Okay. Does it answer your question? Great. Okay. Now, if I have five more minutes, uh, I will just show you a very, a very brief numerical result. Here we are considering the typical IEEE 37 node test feeder with a number of uh, PV systems. Uh, and again, the dynamics of the PVs are modeled as a first of the system with a constant uh, time constant tau. We are updating. Uh, the control is signals every tau seconds, okay? And we are considering also a mismatch uh, where the matrix V, uh, where, <coughs> sorry, the matrix V can be implemented only every two time intervals. So we updated the, co the controlling signals of the PVs twice as fast as the matrix V, okay? Now, here I'm plotting again Again, this one there is a mismatch between the PowerPoint versions, but anyways, here I am plotting the output, the real power output and the reactive power output of the inverters over time, normalized with respect to the time constant of the first order system. And here, if you disregard a little bit this first iteration here, where we are starting the system with a fairly long transient, you can see that at this time instant here, this one and this one, we are artificially simulating a step change in the solar radiation conditions. But still, you see that our inverter outputs are responding fast to this variation in the solar radiation conditions. And they are able to drive over this interval the inverter outputs toward the solution of the underlying optimal powerful problem. Same applies for the reactive power, where here I emphasize again that we are updating the control on signal every tau. Okay? Do you have a question? So the, for the power balance, are you assuming that the, all of the power that is demanded in the system is served by these PVs, or do you also drop? 
this one is a we are considering a grid connected uh, operating code. Yeah. So <coughs> this is, we are you are making up the substation for everything that is not wide but in that, so. But we are also working we are also working for a more sophisticated version that can also handle high mm -hmm. systems. So the extensions in progress uh, we would like to integrate energy storage systems because as of now, this framework applies only to the inverters, as well as legacy components such as capacitor banks and voltage regulators, if needed. We would like to extend this framework here to a constant step size setup in order to facilitate the actual implementation of these schemes. And we would like to explore ways to speed up the computation by resorting to either linearization of the PF or, as other people here have looked into, uh, alternative direction method of multipliers. And then, given the well known uh, argument loop uh, testing capability that we have, we are also looking at ways uh, to bridge theory and experiment uh, and simulate, uh, validate uh, this. Con these controllers here by using Arduino loop uh, testing, uh, where here we have an Opal RT, which is a real time computing platform that is running uh, network models uh, in real time. And this Opal RT here is interfacing through digital to analog controllers uh, and analog to digital converters, I'm sorry, with actual pieces of hardware. Okay? And we are going to utilize in both the so-called power under the loop uh, capabilities to interface actual pieces of hardware with the Opal RT and controller, HIL technologies in order to interface controllers implementing PCB boards uh, with the Opal RT. So this one brings <coughs> me to the end of my talk. <coughs> so the main objective here was the point, bridging the time scale between uh, network-wide optimization and real-time control. In order to do so, we started looking at ways to speed up the computation of lesser points and ways to ensure close-loop stability when, it, when we implement the controllers that we see the past. We show the convergence of this closed-loop system to OPS solution for both the synchronous and the asynchronous setups. And future efforts will be mainly focused on towards you know, validation and implementation of these uh, new class of controllers. And with this, I conclude my talk. And, uh, Now, because we have to restart, I guess, yeah. every few iterations, right? Yeah, if you, use, if you use a constant step size, we will speed up the convergence for sure. Although, instead of claiming asymptotic convergence to the optimal solution, you can claim asymptotic convergence within the board yeah, section yeah. of the solution. But that would be more important with dynamic values, yeah. right? Than yeah. constant step size. Yeah. But the problem is more stopping actually. And why did you need to gradients? Oh, does it mean the first part of the talk? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because essentially we are considering uh, <coughs> the case where we have an exact uh, dual update. Okay. So instead of, if you have an exact, let me, I can go back. Like, like when are you going to be able to handle this? Yeah. I know you can do it. Yeah. 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 Look at this step here, right? This step here. So replace x with u, right? Strong, strongly convex primal function leads to differentiable dual function. So this one is a gradient. This one is the gradient of the dual function evaluated at lambda, right? Now consider replacing, consider having 
x now, where x is a perturbation of u, right? So this is no longer the gradient of the dual function evaluated with this. This one becomes Yeah, you should just know it's constantly iteration, iteration, right? But as long as the iteration, the dynamics is stable, and the noise will eventually be uh, just the mismatch eventually. Okay. In steady state. Is that, uh, I mean, as long as the system is still stable, right? I mean, I know that you will have constantly like noise coming in yeah. every iteration, yeah. but as long as the system yeah. is stable, then Kind of it's not going to be exact. Yeah, it's not but, but, but the same like uh, with the past dynamics of the water, like the diminishes that size would be. Yeah, I see where you're going. I see where you're going. You need to tweak a little bit of proof in order to provide what you're saying. Yeah. But I think that is global and makes it up in the comparison. Yeah, you don't have a symptotic convergence. Yeah, you have boundary convergence. Yeah, you have boundary convergence. Yeah. 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 But the problem there is that how big is the radius of the problem? Huh? But that's fine. Yeah. But, but yeah. you're still dealing with finite time horizon yeah. 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 convergence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a valid point. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, so when you consider all states as P's and Q's, is the controllability of all states implicitly guaranteed or you are have you chosen the network topology such that all states are controllable? Because so that would depend on the topology of the network also. Yeah. Yeah. So since Professor Gross's question was also related to that, if you don't have an idea of the topology, how do we know that controllability is by the default guarantee for all states? So <clears throat> on an inverted basis, the assumption that we have that really in the presentation was that once you specify the support for the inverters, so the inverters will just drive the output of the points uh, irrespective of the network configuration. Now, the next step, uh, the next step, this one in this specific implementation, the next step uh, is to extend this framework uh, where instead of controlling uh, the adaptive power, you are controlling quantity successfully versus the policies. Then, the, then you have to you can bring up issues where you want to mention. But this is the next step. Okay, one more yes, question. Yeah, sure. uh, so since we have so many inverters in place, <coughs> is there any penalty for the harmonics or total harmonic distortion factors in the system? Because I don't see any penalty for uh, any of those. Obviously, the inverter will have its own dynamics and well, uh, uh, harmonic distortion. Or is, is there a penalty for that? There is not only that prevents you. From formulating a very problem where you consider those different harmonics as well as constraints on the total harmonic distortion. And you can extend this framework here for problems like that. There are actually people that look at this and that we'd be happy to see the problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you then. Thank you.